Here we go. I would like to spend the next uh, one hour on three distinct topics. I've been asked to present CERN. So we'll start with CERN, then we'll talk about control systems, which we have in the organization. And the last part of the presentation, we'll talk about cybersecurity on control systems and uh, discuss how we deal with the cybersecurity of the control systems. So um, here we are with CERN. CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Uh, if you just take the bare name, um, the end was nuclear, now we're doing particle physics. So we're celebrating our 60th year anniversary in uh, something like 10, 10 days. Um, we are financed by 20 European countries, not necessarily the European Union, but uh, also other countries like Switzerland, uh, Austria's member. Our main mandate is very, very simple. We are supposed to search the origins which have been posed to us by the universe. So what happened close after the Big Bang? What, what happens on the most lowest layer on, on atoms? What happens inside atoms? Uh, we have a mandate to advance technology in those areas, and we have been asked to do a collaboration, bringing nations together and training new students. If you look at this map here, CERN itself has 2,250 employees, but we're hosting at this very moment something like 15,000 researchers. Those are people which are coming from all the countries over here. So everything what is not white, and the only white spot which we got is unfortunately in Africa because the funding is, uh, for, for traveling is, is not high enough. Uh, all the other countries are sending PhD students, students, bachelor students, professors, physicists, technicians, engineers, any kind of people working in high energy physics are sent to CERN. For working at CERN for a week, just for conference, maybe for a master thesis, staying three, week, three months at CERN and then moving off again. Maybe uh, professors coming to CERN for a week in a month, doing lectures at CERN, and then they move back to the home institute somewhere in America or in China, giving the lectures in China, and then they come back the next month. So there's a come and go of people. The 15,000 people are more or less leaving and, and, and joining CERN very, very often. There's a very, very high turnout which we have. The business is very, very simple. If you take a proton, we're all made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. What you do is you smash two protons together. This is the same thing than uh, trying to understand this iPhone here. If you want to understand this iPhone, um, I dropped it recently, but uh, I dropped, didn't drop it hard enough. If I want to understand how the iPhone is working, I just smash it to the ground, and then I see the bits and pieces and can look inside. Uh, if I'm a little bit more intelligent, I take two iPhones and I collide them. If I collide them fast enough, then more or less I can, again, look inside and uh, try to figure out how the iPhone is working. Uh, for the protons, the same thing. If you, if you take two protons, you collide them, they're both, both positively charged. So the first thing which will, will happen, they repel each other, positive, positive repelling. So if you do this fast enough, then you overcome this, this, this charge, this force, and then you can more or less look into the protons and analyze how the protons are done. In principle, what we're doing is we're putting energy on the spot, and this is, this is the budget which Mother Nature is taking for producing conditions which happen something like a millisecond, a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. This is a very, very important concept to understand what we're doing. So think of me, I'm being an accelerator. I earn my money and put it on the bank account with, the, with, with my bank. And my wife is coming in form of Mother Nature and spending the money. But I don't see how she's spending the money because I am in my office. But I can make a measurement in the evening. So at the evening I go home and I look what she spent the money for. For milk, Coca-Cola, a little bit of beer, wine, Lego and shoes. And if I do this now every evening, I can now do statistics and figure out what are the rules of Mother Nature at my house and I figure out that at, at my place, we're drinking lots of milk and Coca-Cola, a little bit of beer and a little bit of wine, and somebody's collecting Coca-Cola and shoes, uh, Lego and shoes. You get the concept? We do the same thing here. We crash the protons, we give energy on the spot to Mother Nature, and she's then using this, this energy to produce something new, something which happened right after the Big Bang. And we can then take a photo of what has been produced. And if you take millions of photos, you can start analyzing what happened after the Big Bang. So we take the protons, we put the protons together into something we call a bunch, and uh, we put them into something which we call a beam. So there's a red beam and the blue beam. Of course, the beams don't have any color. This is just for, for showing you that they're two different beams. And what we then do is we put the, put the protons in those beams on a very, very high speed. The more speed you can get in the protons, the more energy you get on the spot. The more energy you get on the spot, the more Mother Nature can buy. It's the same thing with me. The more I earn, my wife can start buying something else. At the moment, we are not in the position to buy every month a new car. But if I earn maybe 10 or 24 of the money I'm earning today, I might buy every month a car. So the same thing here. You would like to get the protons as fast as possible so when they crash, the energy on the spot is as high as possible. So we had the utter limit or the upper limit here of, of how fast you can make, make particles. 
We use an accelerator here. This is the Geneva Basin. The Geneva town is here. You can see the airport. It's three kilometers long. The CERN territory is here. My office is actually here. Uh, yeah, you can see it. That pixel is mine. The computer center is just close to me. Switzerland is right to this line. France is to the left of the line, and here are the Jura Mountains. And underground, we got uh, something we call a particle accelerator. We'll show you some pictures of that one, which is used to take the protons and bring them to speed. Why is the particle accelerator that big? It's the same thing with your car. I have a, just an Opel Astra. I need a very, very long motorway to get my car from zero to 100 miles an hour. Yeah, you need to have very some distance because the motor is just too weak. If I would have a faster car, I can take a shorter motorway. The same thing here, it must be big because you would like to bring them at very, very high speed, and very high speed needs, you need to have lots and lots of space. So what we do is we take the protons, we collide them in uh, one, two collision points, and we wrap around those collision points digital cameras, cameras which are a little bit larger than yours, but in principle the same functionality than your digital camera at home, or the digital camera you get in your, in your telephone. Um, here's me and my wife, and uh, in the center of this 43 meter long and 22 meter uh, and diameter detector, we take the pictures. So here we are. It's already interesting like Formula One, but only if there are collisions. Collision simulation is looking like this. There's a collision. Out of the collision come thousands of particles out, and now you take a picture. This is not real. This is simulation. This is a photo how it's looking in reality. Collision point is in the center, and you have now taken all your digital camera away, and what you see here is all the different particles which are coming out of the collision. Think of a car accident. This is like a car accident where you can see here the tires, and here's the steering wheel, and there are the, the doors. You just reconstruct later everything together to figure out what happened during the time of the collision. There's another picture of the collision. Collision is happening in the center, and your, your digital camera is wrapped around this collision point just to see what is happening here. And we, can, we are able to see all the debris coming out of the collision point and record them. And now the physicists are taking this picture and reconstruct from all the information they got here what happened in the core. It's something like a small puzzle and there are lots and lots of puzzles which they are doing. So as an accelerator, what we then do with the data is very easy. We're taking something like a 40 million pictures a second. Um, overall is the raw data rate one petabyte per second, which we cannot just store. This is, important, uh, is impossible. So we do some selection, and in the end, we end up with something like 20 to 30 petabyte of data per year, which we store in our computer center. This is one of our computer centers. The, the first rows here are used then to analyze the photos, and those ones are used to store the 100 petabytes of data on hard disks. And uh, worldwide, we distribute them from our computer center here in Geneva. We distribute the, the data to computer centers in America, in Europe, and also in Asia, in Japan, and in Taiwan. So the data is distributed, so the physicists worldwide can access the data to see what happened at the collision point. So they will get millions and millions of pictures and then analyze the picture. You can do the same thing, go to Picasa and start an analyzing on Picasa, just analyzing pictures of, um, of male 42-year security officers, and then you start your, your own analysis. And if you do this properly, if you do this for a couple of years, you end up somewhere on The Economist, and uh, then you get a Nobel Prize like, um, like um, Francois Englert and Peter Higgs got because they were, they were um, predicting 40 years ago some mechanisms which we just detected by analyzing all the data. But 40, 50 years ago, they already said there must be something which is working in that way. We just have, don't have the, the budget, the energy on the spot to really measure this. So this is a very, very, very important, very, very interesting feat, making a prediction 50 years ago, something which you cannot measure at that time in the 60s, but now we are in the, in, the, in the 21st millennium, so we can do. Control systems, so where are the control systems? There are hundreds. We've got 130 different control systems. Some control systems are very small, a few HMIs, maybe uh, somewhere a data historian, an engineering station, and some PLCs. Some are very big, containing of something like 500 to 1,000 servers, hundreds, if not even thousands of PLCs, lots of data points. So um, if you look at our accelerator complex, this looks a bit Familiar to you, at least this one, this is what I've shown you on the map of Geneva. And everything else are all accelerators. Accelerators like your gearbox. So I think of this as the, um, as the London tube or the New York metro. We start our protons here, we deliver the protons and accelerate them once, accelerate them the second gearbox twice, accelerate them even more, and then you accelerate them to the maximum. It's like a gearbox. I've never seen a car where you can just put in the fifth gear and then accelerate from zero to 100. You need to have the first gear, second gear, third gear, and so on. So this is what we do, and then we can deliver the beams to other destinations. We get other research facilities which are doing other researches with, with particle beams. So for example, medical research or research on, on, on um, proteins or molecules. How's this looking in reality? Uh, first, what you, need to, which, what you need to have is control systems which are making sure that your beam is staying where it's supposed to be and making a circle. 
If the beam is not staying in the circle, then the beam will just move outside, and if the beam is outside, outside is nothing, there's all underground, so it's, uh, you won't see anything. So um, you need to have a control system, which is just making sure that your beam is going around every circle. We call this the beam orbit. And the second thing which is important is timing. If you think of, of your car, if you get the clutch and the, the, the change of the gear wrong, wrong timing, it's not working out. The same thing here, if you give one beam to the next one, you have to get the timing right. If you don't get the timing right, then the beam will just get lost. So I was looking reality. This is something like an accelerator. In the center here is a very small tube, as big as this, where the protons are going through. And this 40 meter long device is then taking the beam and accelerating the beam from something like uh, zero speed to 30% 30 of, uh, 30 of speed of light. Then you give it to the next accelerator, which is round, and in this accelerator, you accelerate the beams to something like 90% of speed of light. And you see the curvature is getting bigger. This is an old picture, but the machine is still existing. You can see here the beam pipe. The beam is going in the middle of this pipe here, and here it's accelerated to something like 99% of, of speed of light. And then you go further. You see the curvature is going, 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 uh, um, going lower. Here's the beam pipe again, and everything else is only apparatuses to keep the beam on a, on a curved trajectory. Nowadays, the biggest machine which we have um, needs to have a radio frequency for accelerating the beam, and the beam pipe needs to be vacu evacuated. You fill vacuum in, so you make sure that the, the beam is not colliding with the air, the remaining air, um, so that you don't have collisions in the accelerator, but only in collision points. This is clear so far. The LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, you can see the curvature, 27 kilometers in circumference. You can't see anything anymore. You're just sitting on something like a big, big, big long uh, steel vessel. Um, this is because, due to the fact that we have to use uh, some superconducting cables, um, every accelerator needs to have some, some magnets to steer the beam. The magnets are bending the beam into a curvature. So you need to have a, a magnet, and you build up a magnet out of a copper cable, usually. Open your doorbell, and you see a magnet, and this, this, this copper, copper coil. We need to use, we cannot use copper anymore, because copper cannot take 10,000 amps. So we have to use superconducting cables, which can sustain 10,000 amps. And um, the cost for this is very simple. Here's the copper cable wound up. The beam is going in the center. The beam pipe would be here. We have to cool down the cables and everything what is holding it together to minus 270 degrees Celsius. So the whole accelerator over 27 kilometers is cooled down to 1.9 degrees Kelvin or minus 20, 270 degrees Kelvin, uh, Celsius because at that temperature, the superconducting cable actually is superconducting. If you have it at minus 270 degrees, at 260 degrees or higher, the cable is normal conducting, and 10,000 amps with normal conducting cable will melt away the cable. So here we are. Those are the magnets. Here are the two beam pipes. They are ready for transport down. The size of the beam is as big as the euro on the uh, on Spain, on the one euro coin. And the critical thing with Spain here is, if Spain is getting lost in the beam pipe here, here inside, it is hitting the beam pipe. It will open up the beam pipe, like with a laser saber of, of Star Wars. It will go in the magnet. The magnet here, as I said, needs to be cooled down to minus 270 degrees Celsius. Cold magnet with a, he, uh, with a hot beam will evaporate the helium. The helium cannot go out, so it will look for a way out. It will break open the, open the magnets and will destroy the next 100 meters of magnets. Losing the beam inside the machine is a danger for the machine. It will destroy the machine. There won't be any other consequences, but the machine will be dead. So safety systems are very, very important. If you look at control systems now, first, what is important is access. You need to have some biometry to go into the tunnel, because when you are in the tunnel and there's beam in the machine, the beam is emitting some kind of, uh, kind of X-ray light. X-ray light for the human body is not as good, so you do not want to stay in the machine, so we're monitoring who's going inside. This is the same technology which is used in some uh, nuclear plants. And then we're doing radiation monitoring, just making sure that the beam is not doing something wrong. And then last but not least, you have to get rid of the beam at a certain moment. You have to dump the beam. As I said, the beam is lethal. If the beam is lost in the machine somewhere, it will destroy the machine. So we have one point. The point is here, where the beam can be more or less put from a circular path into a straight path, into a 300-meter-long tunnel. And in the straight path, we, we, we build up the beam from the size of Spain to the size of the Earth. And then we send it on a target, which is something like lead or, or carbon. And the carbon is heating up by 1,000 degrees, and everything is fine. So this is the normal cycle. If you look at this from the controls perspective, here's our control center. We have different accelerator complexes. So here is the 30% of speed of light and 90% of speed of light. Here we go up until 99% of speed of light. This is the LHC with the superconductivity and everything else. And this is the infrastructure, facility monitoring, uh, cryogenics, cooling ventilation, technical assistance. 
So everything here is based on standard technologies. You can see all the screens. Some of the screens are Windows screens, having some uh, Windows-based UIs. There's some other screens which uh, are running Linux with some Java-based UIs uh, programmed by, the, by, by CERN. And uh, you find even some hardware. Here's, for example, um, the access system, which is based completely on hardware. Since this is safety relevant, we do not have any computers in the, in the way. This is looking like an HMI is looking for the cryogenics. Um, should be familiar for you if you have seen um, HMIs before. You can see here all the dewars, all the lines, all the valves, all the measuring points for the cryogenics. And um, you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those screens are all sitting here. This is the whole range here. It's full of screens only for the cryogenics. This is for the powering of the magnets. There are 1,232 green dots. Every green dot shows that the magnets are working properly. And then you got uh, more screens for taking the data. Here you can see more or less the same event display, and here you can see if your apparatus is working properly. If you look at the data taking, this is the detector, all the particles coming out. This is how a detector is looking like. This is a wafer. It's something like uh, eight centimeters times four. If you look at this, this is the same thing you get in the digital camera. It's your small pixel in the digital camera, which is taking the photo. With us, we have them a little bit larger, and we have to arrange them in a circle so we can measure all the particles coming out here. So we're wrapping this around the collision point in multiple layers. Here you can see how the multiple layers are pushed together. And this is then um, another measurement where we got some uh, lead crystals. This is a bar of lead, completely transparent. But if there's a particle going through, you can measure that the particle went through, and you can detect how much energy the particle had. If we would have more time, we can go in the details. But uh, here we just can tell you that uh, we have 100 million data channels per experiment. There are four experiments, so we are talking about 400 to 500 million data channels. All of them are analog, so you read them out, and uh, if you take one picture, then you have something like a, like a data of 10 megabytes per picture. And we're taking, as I said, something like 40 million pictures a second, so you have to read out all this, this amount. This is how it's looking if you go down into, into, the, into the tunnels. The beam, in the end, will come through here. This is the surface hall, so this going down here is 100 meters. What we drop down here is one part of the detector. You can see uh, some part of, of measuring devices uh, mounted up here on the wheels. If you put this together, you can see it here again. This is another experiment. Uh, this is the outer vessel of the experiment. Inside is the detector. You can see a little bit of the detector, and you can see a guy standing here. If you look at a little bit closer, here's the beam pipe again with the two beams. As I said, they're big. And everything else around here is controls equipment, measurement devices for recording the photos. So in such a detector, you have the usual stuff. We have one million control channel for one of, the, of each of the detector, measuring what is the temperature inside, pressure, is there radiation, is everything cool or not. So there are lots and lots of control systems even used on, in, in those experiments. This is how a control system looking like. If you go into the service caverns, uh, this is electric power, standard hardware, which you find uh, everywhere else. We got gas distribution for uh, cooling or for, for provisioning some of the detectors with certain kind of gas like argon, and nitrogen, sometimes oxygen, just to make sure that this is there. We also provide super cool water, so water which is still fluid, but under zero degrees Celsius. This is how a cooling ventilation plant is looking like. And last but not least, we got safety systems. We have to monitor what is happening underground. So we're monitoring safety, personal safety, if somebody is going in, who is in, where is he, using some, some mechanisms for, for geolocalization of the people. And we have smoke detections. Is there somewhere a fire? Fire can be very dangerous for the experiments because they're very, very tight, dense, and uh, contained. And then we're measuring uh, oxygen deficiency. Is there some problem of a leak? Is there some helium leaking out? Is there some argon leaking out? Is this then removing the air so that people cannot work there anymore? Safety systems here, if you look at this, they, everything what is marked in orange here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Those are 12 racks of a safety system. They are based on standard technology. Here it is a Siemens redundant PLC pair, run, reading something like 2,000, 3,000 uh, different distinct monitoring points for the safety and then taking something like 100 to 200 distinct actions. Since the safety system actions are very simple, they just switch off something. So we are, we're doing more. Uh, this is one of the dipole magnets which we were using for the LHC. This one is a prototype, and this is used as a telescope, which you mount, uh, which, you, which you point at the sun in morning hours and evening hours, and we're doing measurement of particles coming from the sun. We are doing medical research. This is something like a detector, which is uh, interestingly installed uh, close to Vienna in uh, Wiener Neustadt for the university hospital, something like a project for medical research and medical treatment. Um, this is um, a beam test facility. Again, you see the beam pipes here, and all the apparatus is around to, to guide the beams around a certain shape of path. And last but not least, not many people know, International Space Station here. There's a small experiment, which is 
not very different from the, from the photos I've shown you before in terms of functionality, uh, which is hooked up on the International Space Station and the control room for this one, and the whole control is taken from CERN. We've got a dedicated control room, which is something like a NASA-style control room on-premises, which is communicating with Marshall State Space Station, uh, with Marshall um, Space Center, and then going via satellite links up to the ISS. So even here we take data of particles which are crossing from the universe, from the galaxy, going through the detector, and then this is producing lots and lots of similar photos I've shown you before, and those photos are then analyzed again in some kind of a network of computer centers. Other control systems, something more simple. This is something like a, um, a welding machine. You see the Linux-driven HMI. This is a, I think this is a plier machine where you can, where you can bend some metal, and you get a UI here. Here's the start button. This is uh, definitely uh, Windows. This other one is also Windows. So we get lots and lots of workshops where you get lots and lots of more control systems. So don't think about only about the con big control systems. Control systems are everywhere. Here's another control system of the fire brigade where, doing, where they're doing all the, the monitoring of all their, the fire sensors. Uh, they got a map and they got all their, their HMIs here and some hardware in a, in, a, in, a, in a room located close to that. And last but not least, conference rooms. This is a conference room system where you can uh, start the conference in a way that you just dim down the light. You can set the light on the exhibition mode or if the cleaning personnel is coming in or you can show off the light. We have some, some kind of a transparent glass which you can make transparent or you can make it opaque for, for visualization if you have some, some visitor tours to give. And this is, again, this here is uh, running on a small web server which is on a Raspberry Pi. And I can tell you if I have some security problems, I got lots of security problems with the system here. So in brief, control systems at CERN, all the aberrations of control systems which we have are here. I will not go through them, but it's more or less everything what I mentioned before. You got the beams here, so you got the different types of accelerators. The LHC is the biggest one, which is here. You got lots and lots of monitoring systems for the LHC. You would like to know what is the temperature in the LHC. You would like to make sure that cooling ventilation is working. You would like to be able to power. So this is only for the infrastructure to run the accelerator. You need to have vacuum, so you need to have a vacuum system pumping out, sucking out all the air from the, from the beam pipe. And this is an ultra high vacuum which you find only in outer space. You need to suck quite a lot to get all the air particles out. And then you get all the monitoring of the beam. As I said, the beam is lethal. If the beam is starting to hit the beam pipe, this is game over for the X-rayer. So you need to know where's the beam, where's the beam orbit. We got different systems on beam orbit. We get beam TV somewhere knowing where the beam is. We can measure outside from the electric field of the beam where the beam position is. So there are lots and lots of different safety systems just making sure that you always know where the beam is. In addition to the accelerator systems here, we get all the experiments. Every experiment has a name. Some experiments consist out of 3,000 people just working for the experiments. Some smaller experiments are maybe five, six different universities with 50 people. But there are lots and lots of experiments which are just receiving the beam, and then they can take pictures of what they get from the beam. So you can shoot the beam, as I said, beam, beam, having energy on the spot, but you can take also the beam and just hit it into some kind of molecules or into some kind of a, a sample, some, some material, making material science. And those experiments are all built up for, for those purposes. And then we get infrastructure, uh, access control system, gas monitoring, this is fire brigade, this is access monitoring again, and then cooling ventilation, um, energy, facility management, and lots and lots, of, lots and lots more. Those are all the control systems which we have, and those are all the control systems which we have to maintain. The problem I have is lots of this stuff is a one-time prototype. We are not a, 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 a plant which is repeated or where other people are using the same technology. The LHC is only one. Worldwide, the community can just afford one. The LHC costs something like four and a half billion US dollars, you cannot build a second one. You cannot afford this. So we have one. It's an all-time prototype, which automatically means that the accelerator, the experiments, are developed, maintained, operated by an international collaboration. The people who are bringing in components for the LHC or the LHC itself or the experiments are not built at CERN. They're built in Austria. They're built at somewhere in America, in China, in Afghanistan. Everybody is, every physics research institute which is participating in those research is bringing in a part of detector, a part of accelerator. Which means that if everything has been put together, I cannot ship in all the people and just locate them all in the Geneva Basin. They cannot live all in this area. So the expertise is still somewhere in California with Slack, somewhere in China with the University of Beijing, somewhere in, in Afghanistan, somewhere in Japan, somewhere in Austria. The expertise is still away. So this means that the physicists, engineers, technicians, PhD students, all the other people, need to have remote access to the systems. 
So now I have a control system which is vast, where there are plenty. Everything is openly documented and, and, and discussed. Many of the components of the LHC are discussed again and again and again in the past on conferences. How do you do it the best? How do you do superconducting cables? How do you get 10,000 amps from the cables? How do you design an experiment? Which components do you need? How is the control system looking like? If you're interested in those things, ECALABS is the conference for instrumentation control system for experiments. ICLA, ECALABS, EPSC. So just check this, it's all public. The documentation of the LHC, all technical documentation, more or less, is all public. This is part of the mandate of CERN, making our research, making our technical designs public enough that everybody else in principle can build your own, your own LHC. Remote access is a must because the expertise for parts of the detector are with some guys somewhere sitting in Barcelona. And I can't fly them in if there's a small problem. You need to give them remote access. Last but not least, security knowledge is something we have because we're here, but there are many, many more people who just don't have any security knowledge. We just cannot assume that they have. There might be lots of brilliant physicists, but this doesn't mean that they have the, the, the holy grail of knowing everything. In particular, they have not the holy grail of also knowing what security means. So, here are my physicists sitting in a conference, and if you um, discuss with them about security, you get something like a, may I point out, that I'm not a circus, that I don't have a, a tail, and I don't feel like being treated like a circus dog. This is the response on some of the security principles we have. So um, people do not want to follow guide, guidelines, don't want to follow security rules due to the fact they're used to something like an academic environment, an open environment. They would like to do what they want. And I have to balance this academic environment with operations of accelerating the experiment and with security. We are quite liberal here, but there are some rules. Uh, why, why there are idiotic policies in place to forbid the use of certain technologies? At a certain moment in time, we were blocking all peer-to-peer -peer traffic just to avoid that uh, file sharing is happening. We lifted this since because nowadays file sharing is also happening via web pages like Dropbox and, uh, and others. So um, we didn't want to go against technology but against pr principle, which we still do. But those are the emails which I'm getting. Um, I failed to pass the security courses. The questions were so stupid that sometimes it's difficult to answer. If you want to meet me personally, I can teach you computer security. From the text here, I can tell you exactly which nationality the guy has. It is uh, Eastern Europe. And um, we, we sent him an email back and said, yes, we would like to learn how you do it. And he never came back to us. But this is the people I'm, I have to face. And last but not least, I'm not sure that you have fully appreciated that the computer security is not the raison d'etre of CERN. So some people are even questioning whether we need to have security while we're in an open academic environment. So this is the people I'm facing, and this is why, how I have to generate computer security now with them. If you think again about the people, the people can come to CERN, they can work remotely, but they can come to CERN if they're here at CERN for a week in a month. I can't give them a laptop. We're doing bring your own device since, since 20 years because a physicist is coming from abroad with his MIT laptop or with his University of Vienna laptop or you with your laptop. You're used to your laptop. They don't want to have now a CERN laptop because they're just for one week at CERN. This doesn't fly. I can provide a CERN, I can provide a CERN laptop, but only in English or in French. What do I do with now a Chinese calibrator or an Indian calibrator? Can I give them a laptop in their language? What about all the applications they are used to use in the university at home? All the data they have, do they know to mirror the data on my laptop? It doesn't fly. We need to have bring your own device. We have bring your own device in our office network since 20 years. We have 40,000 devices registered to our, net, to our office network tablets, mobile phones, PCs, laptops, and they're all working there. Admittedly, this network is always a little bit in a kind of fever because if the people come in, I cannot check, I cannot guarantee whether your laptop, when you connect it to our network, is infected. You need to register and then you can connect, but we're not doing any screening. We don't have a carotene zone because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to have a carotene zone to really detect something. So the network, the office network, is always in some kind of fever. I don't worry, because if your laptop is infected, at a certain moment we'll detect that your laptop is infected, we will take you offline, and if a physicist don't see Facebook anymore, or no Twitter anymore, they pay you a coffee to get online again. And the only thing I'm asking is reinstall your computer. We're not doing any forensic, we're not doing any research. Infected, you reinstall, usually takes the people half a, half a day, and after that, the people already know what patching means and antivirus software and all the, the careful things means, but uh, this is the moment where we interact with the people. So on the network, there are two kind of devices. Those devices which can withstand 
viral scans from other devices which are infected, and those devices which are getting infected because they're not, not secured. And this is what I would like to detect. The devices which are not secured must be secured, and the best way to secure devices, reinstall it from scratch with something which is recent, up to date, and maintained. And um, sometimes this is happening. Nowadays, we are blocking from the network. Um, think of those 20,000 active, 40,000 total devices. From the 20,000 devices, we block maybe two or three per month, which are, getting, which are detected being infected. So here we are. Uh, this is on Pastebin, if you know Pastebin. Using the exploit on CERN would be a win, hacking the people who created the internet. So this is what we're facing. There are people targeting CERN. You do not find money at CERN. We have a budget, and we spend the budget, but we're not a bank. You don't find confidential information at CERN. Yes, we got personal files, medical records, pension fund files, um, but we do not have anything else which is confidential. We are not a military installation. We are not doing any military research. <laughs> Everything what we do is public. The design data is public. You want to read them? edms.cern.ch. This is our document store. cds.cern.ch is another document store. One is for technical data. The other one is for physics result. Everything is public. This is what physicists are used to. They must publish or they perish. This is how you do an academic career. What do you got here? They defaced a certain subdomain that was one CPU away from one of the detectors and could shut the LHC off. If you just read the sentence the second time, they defaced a certain subdomain. How can you deface a certain subdomain? Not completely precise. That was one CPU away, this is a strange distant measure, from one of the detectors and could shut the LHC off. Detectors and LHC are two different things. Uh, one CPU away, you see, but this is what people are doing, hacking the Large Hadron Collider. They're trying to people, they try to get in for the kudos. Just, I have hacked CERN, I was in, I made it. So this is what we're facing from time to time. Um, I'm writing a post involving CERN, LHC, SCADA, and passwords. This was ringing our bell, and this is why I got a Twitter account, just to monitor those things. This is Ruben Santamata, might be known to some of you guys. He's a very nice chap, uh, it's a white, hack, white hat, and uh, he found something in the end. What he found was a simple PDF, with something like an access code in, how do you go for one of our monitoring systems? So you have read access to monitor, but it was, uh, for him, severe enough to report this. And he reported this to the Department of Homeland Security in the US, to the Swiss Melanie, and directly to us. And uh, we appreciated this. I met him in, at, at Black Hat last, uh, last August, and I thanked him again. And uh, this is how we're working. And this is another guy, um, uh, Dan Tantler, uh, I think. He reported another thing where you found some web pages which were dodgy. And uh, he said, look here, here are lots of monitoring pages which are, which are public. Is this really what you intend to do? And the answer to him was more or less, yes, most of them are supposed to be public because we have to show our physics community what the status of the actuators are, what the status of data taking are, what is the status of the data distribution across computer centers, and what is the status of the actuator. So and, um, then he's saying everything, uh, everything has been taken offline. Thank you very much, sir, and so um, you're welcome. To give you an idea what security incidents are at CERN, I got here one which is um, a very simplistic one. What you see here, before I start the film, what you see here is a, um, a, Safari, pic a Safari window. Uh, everything what's happening first is happening in the UL bar here. What you see here is something which is completely normal. Don't think that this is a control system. You cannot take any control from this web page. This is a status page. If somebody who is working on this detector, on the liquid argon colorimeter, is interested in what is the state of the detector, he's just going on the web page, and he can look that everything is green, read some temperatures, just checking out the detector. This is a web page which has been set up by somebody um, just to make information flow from the inside, from the control system, via some proxies to the outside world. Completely normal in my world. I'm not sure if you run a, a chemical plant, whether you would like to show the status of a chemical plant to anybody else. We have to do, there are 3,000 people working for the experiment, 3,000 potential people interested in this, in this. So if I start the film, it will start here with some, some, some trials of um, HTML code injection, and then you will see that the, the guys are doing command line injection. The film is 90 seconds. We have reproduced the film following the logs we had from this attack. So here we go. Um, if you haven't seen this before, somebody's fiddling around here and is seeing whether he can inject now some information into the web page, which he can. He's now trying whether he can in, in inject some HTML code into the web page, like underlining and italic, and underlining and italic he can. So the next step which you do is, can you inject code, ID? Yes, you can. ID is giving you who's running the web server. It's an Apache web server, so you can see that it's, uh, it's here. And with U9-A, you can get an idea when the server has been patched. So the, the timestamp of the server is November, 2000, uh, November 2009. It's an old video. And if you look here, 
the kernel is dated January, uh, January 19th. So you can figure out from this one that the server hasn't been patched for something like nine months. So this is something for an attacker which is just completely juicy. You can make command line injection and you know what the, the patch status is. Now you just go on the internet and you figure out which security bulletins have been published between January and November. They haven't been patched, so I just take one exploit of one of the, uh, the bulletins and then attack the server. And this is what happened in the rest of the film. Very simple. For the ease of life, the first thing the attacker is doing, he doesn't want to fiddle around here in the, in the UL bar, so he's uh, installing something which is a backdoor, so he's establishing now a line of sight between his attacking computer somewhere in the world and this web server at CERN. Um, this is a guy of mine, so Romain is working for me. He's doing the attack from CERN, but this is only to get the video. So now he's listening and waiting for the back call of the web server, which should happen in some like a couple of seconds. This was much too quick. Shoot. So here's the callback. And from that moment on, he doesn't need to fiddle around anymore with the, with the UL bar. He has now a terminal on the machine. The next step is, at the moment, it's still running in the Apache context. This is the web server. But he knows that he just has to download an exploit to exploit and uh, make privilege escalation from Apache to root. This is the exploit, it's called Wunderbar Exploit, Wunderbar Emporium, here it is. You untar, you unzip, you go in, you execute, here you are, Apache, and um, executing now the exploit, and within four, three, two, one, zero, minus one, minus two, minus, here we are, exploit. This is 90 seconds. This is why computer security is important, this is what we're teaching our people, that Command line injection, not checking the input, no input validation, no sanitization of input can lead to such things. Not patching. Eric isn't here, but this is why patching is important, in particular when you're facing something which is connected to the internet. So those are the events which we're dealing with, not on the controls level, but those are the events which we're dealing with on the, on the business level facing the internet. We got similar things. This is a web page hacking the Large Hadron Collider authorization bypass. Here they believed they were bypassing authorization. In the end, they were just on the test page and uh, they didn't get anything juicy. Web, face, web page defacement. This happened in 2008. And uh, about the consequences. There are even videos on, on YouTube which are saying we hacked the control center. But this is just relating of the defacement of one single web page. So computer security. I have to balance the academic freedom of my constituency. The people are used to bring in their own device. The people are used to use their own programming language and use the tools they want to use. If they want to program in Java, C++, Perl, they can do. They can even fight whether Perl, Ruby, or Python is the best. There are some people programming still in, in BASIC, in Pascal, in Fortran. Some people are pro even pro um, pro uh, programming in Assembler. They got the liberty. They can do. This is how they, they work most efficiently. If you start now to teach everybody, tell everybody you just go and everything you program is in Java, I will kill the organization. If I now tell everybody you take my laptop with my installation, my software suites, and you run this, and it's Windows, I might stop people from working. If I tell everybody you just use this kind of web server, you do not use Drupal, you use SharePoint, this will get, kill creativity. So we need to maintain this. We need to give the people the freedom to, to develop, to do what they want to. This is academia. You wouldn't do this in a bank. In a bank, you would like to control your PCs but I would like to foster creativity. I need to leave this open. So my job is finding a proper balance. And the important point of the proper balance is I'm not responsible for computer security. I decline this. I'm, I'm the head of computer security at CERN. I am not the person responsible for computer security. I just declined that. Why do I do this? Because I don't control my environment. How can I take responsibility of something which I don't control? I'm not, I'm not taking responsibility for my kids if they do something very, very weird because I don't see them. So I'm, I'm not taking responsibility of myself if I'm riding a motorcycle because I never learned it and I can't. So um, it would be foolish from me if I resume now about this academic freedom, the responsibility. Instead, what we did is we delegated the responsibility for computer security to everybody. If somebody wants to use its own computer, we make it clear. It's your computer, you're responsible for computer security, you make sure that your computer is up to date or we just uh, disconnect you from the network and then you can pay me a coffee, but you have to reinstall. If you set up a web server, it's your responsibility. You set up the web server, if it's getting hacked, we talk together again. You are responsible for the web server. If you don't know what you do, we can talk. 
you want to have a database, set up your own database, if you don't know how to do it properly and uh, you, you screw up the security, it's your responsibility in the first line. Control system, you run a control system, you are part, you are responsible for an accelerator, you're responsible for the security, you're also responsible for the safety, by the way, and you're responsible for the availability, and you're responsible for anything else, to just think it's, it's a package. You set up a web server, when you do a web server, you're responsible that the web page is always there, availability, that it's functional and usable for your constituency. So you're, all this ITs, availabilities, functionalities, usabilities, you're responsible for this one, and you're also responsible for security. I am not. But if you cannot take this responsibility, you can go to the IT department. And the IT department can give you databases which are maintained by professional database administrators, and they can give you a database. Oracle, MS SQL, whatever you need, you can get the database. If you need to have a web server, you can get a web server from the IT department. Everything up to Apache, and then you can put your Python or your, your CGI or whatever, you can put it on top of that. If you don't want to do this, you need to have a contents management system, you can get Drupal, SharePoint, maintained by the IT department professionals. If you don't want to patch your computer because you have no clue how this is done, get a laptop from the IT department, you get Windows, Linux, or Mac, they take care of the patching. Same for your control system. If you run a control system and you do not want to deal with the security, you can get this partially from the IT department. So we, as a security team, we are acting as a facilitator. By the way, what is here, this is something like our service catalog. It's hard to read, but we got um, some um, um, HR applications here. We got somewhere file systems. We got all our storage systems here. So unfortunately, um, everything is green. So we have lots and lots of services. The IT, IT department is 300 people strong. They are providing more or less close to 300 different services for our constituency. You would like to set up a video, con video conference, IT department video conferencing system. You need to store some of your documents, document storage. You need to have some file space. Maybe you need something like a one terabyte of file space in the computer center. You don't need to worry, file space. Of course, you can store it locally on your small USB hard disk. But in the computer center, you can make sure that access is protected and that you get regular backups, which is not guaranteed by, by your USB drive in your desk. Yeah, somebody might steal it, and definitely you do not have any backup. So we are a security team. We are mainly acting as a facilitator and enabler. We're discussing with people. We're trying to convince people that security is also important. We're trying to convince people that they are responsible for the security. We're doing consultancy. If you come with your web server to me and say, oh, I have a very nice web server, I would like to do this and that, we check with you whether IT service is not more appropriate for you, whether you get the knowledge to do this. This is what we're doing all the day. We're trying to enable the people that they can assume consciously the security responsibility. We do not have any big sticks and we don't have any heavy rules. Yes, there are some rules of the use of our comp computing facilities, but there are no very big sticks because what I learned is forcing people to do something proper with the intelligent clientele I got is impossible. If I start now blocking certain web pages, my clientele is intelligent enough to find a tunnel and tunnel through some way. So now I do it small like, like, a, like, a, like a cat and mouse game, then I, I start now blocking somewhere the, the tunnels, then they find other ways. So you just chase them, and it's not good. They're wasting, wasting their time, and uh, I'm trying to do something which I do not want to. So um, there are no very big, big, big rules which we have. If you screw up, you lose internet connectivity or you lose the account, and in the worst case, you meet me in my office and the HR department head, and then you might be expelled from your organization if you've done something very, very utterly wrong. So. How do we do, do this? We start with people. This is why computer security, at least in my organization, is a sociological problem. If there is something like a small puddle of water on the, on, the, on the floor, who is responsible for protecting everybody else? This is not the building safety officer or the, the side safety officer. This is your responsibility. This puddle of water, you take the water up so nobody's slipping, or you fence it, you put something around, and you call somebody who's taking the water up. In the worst case, there's a big water leak, you call the fire brigade but you're responsible for the safety. We do the same thing with security. We tell everybody in awareness campaigns again and again and again that everybody is responsible for computer security. It's very basic. It's the same messages which you would give your mom at home. So how do you do with phishing emails? What is your password? Data protection? What is copyright? Uh, how do you do patching and so on? Very, very basic stuff. But it's, it's, it's following a logic. You start with basic awareness and you let everybody do an online security course. Again, a course with a few slides, a few questions, and people are getting something like imprinted something like security. From that moment on, people start thinking about security. I'll give you an example. In 2009, we have been hit by a phishing campaign against CERN. 1,400 people got a phishing email. 40 people replied and gave the password away. 
30 we were able to detect because the spamming then with the account started from CERN web server, uh, from CERN mailing system, and this we can contain because nobody at CERN can send more than 3,000 mails a day, so there was no damage done. But the other 10, they were forwarding, forwarding the emails from the CERN account to the mail address of the university or Gmail, which they can because uh, maybe your primary mail address is with the University of Barcelona and you're just uh, ir irregularly working at CERN. So we asked those 40 people, why did you answer? It were not the youngest or the oldest which were answering, um, not the ones where you say they are, they are more intelligent than the others, they are gaining more money than the others, not the females, not the males. What you figured out is that it was just a moment. You know, Stefan, I was working there, I was doing some calculation, I was doing something. I got this email, bing, I said, well, web IT mail, I just answered this because I just wanted to get rid of the email, I just want to continue working, to just answer that and then continue. And later it occurred to me, maybe this was not completely right, but I didn't, didn't, didn't really think consciously about this. So you see, phishing emails is a question of the moment and awareness. So now we've done awareness. Nowadays, we don't lose any accounts to phishing anymore. Out of 22,000 accounts, we lose maybe one or two per month to phishing. And uh, usually, we spot this immediately because if the spam campaign is kicking in, then uh, the, the email system is, is raising alert, and we block the accounts. Once we're at that level, we can give the developers, and there are plenty of developers, all the physicists are doing development one kind or the other. We can give them easy tools, static code analyzers, like Floor Finder. Very basic tools. They don't find all your security flaws, by far not. But they don't have any false positives, which means that if the physicists are running this and they see some benefits, but they don't see any false positives, which are fake, then they learn that this is a very good tool for them to improve their code automatically. At that stage here, they're also thinking of looking at compiler output. There are many people who are not looking at the compiler output or even not enabling all the compiler output. This is something like a blunder. Go to fail. This is a blunder. Go to go to two lines of a code in, in Apple software could have been detected by more or less any of those tools easily, but you need to run them. If I'm at that moment, developers start on secure programming courses. So we got developing secure software, secure coding in Perl, Python, C++, Java applications, Java web applications, PHP web applications. That is the moment where training kicks in. And I think this is how we learned, how we met the first time, getting training from Siemens at the time. So now we're at the level where the people start consciously thinking about computer security, not clicking on phishing emails anymore, and now starting questioning. Instead of setting a web server in the corner, they come first to us and saying, thank you. They're saying that, um, what, about, what about more security in my web server? How can I set it in a secure fashion? Here we are. Once the people understand that the rest is easy, they get care, they have a software development lifecycle, they're using standard build tools for office, for computer center technologies, and also for control systems. So IT is doing the basic for computer center services, and for control systems. They're providing all the networking. They provide all the accounting. We just have one account, one central account, which is used for control systems, and which is used for your office application. Just one. We have a single sign-on portal, and we can use multi-factor authentication where we need. If we deem that the control system is sensitive, we just put another factor on in front of this. But we are not dealing with different credentials, because different credentials, more and more credentials, the people will start writing them down or using easy credentials or the same. We don't want to have that. I would like to have control. My control point is here, single sign-on. If I need to block you, I can do it here, I can do it here, and your account doesn't work anymore for mailing, nor does it work anymore for the control system, and we are at least in a secure state. Then we're doing patching. We provide central servers for hardware and virtualization clusters, also for control systems, standard operating system with an adapted pro uh, patching process for control systems. So no, we do not patch in situ control systems. We do this on the centrally provided uh, office computers in the computer center but we can give the controls expert a small button saying you deploy. So you're getting an email saying the recent Microsoft patches are ready, deploy them at your convenience. And this is then your, your maintenance frame where you, where you can deploy them. So this is a screen of, of, a, of an oscilloscope which got hacked. Um, I can't delve into details because I'm more or less running out of time. Uh, we're providing central file, databases, license servers, and web servers for control systems. We're taking more or less away everything from the controls community. We try to take everything away from the controls community, which is not a core business. You're a control system engineer. It's in your name. You're doing a control system. You're doing a process. You should take, take on the process. It's the same thing. You should not do networking. You shouldn't do operating systems. You shouldn't do databases. Those are tools which you just take out of, out of the toolbox provided by the IT department. And then... We try to give control system experts the same tools we use for, for standard programming. You can do 
control system programming with the same software development life cycles. Versioning system, ticketing systems, the same tools, nightly builds. This is what we're doing. If the accelerator set software, part of the accelerator software, is built every night, you do regression testing, you're watching what your changes in your code are, any security flaws introduced by some, some, bug, some code changes, and so on. And then you have your new build, and the new build is ready, and once the accelerators are in a, in a standby mode, you just roll out the new code into the field. The advantage, we have also accurate inventories. I know exactly where are my accounts, where are my devices, where are my web pages, and where's the owner behind. Every firewall opening I have, you're asking for a firewall opening for, for your web server, I put your name behind if there's something with the opening. Maybe there's no traffic to your web server, you get an email from me automatically saying, oh, look here, this is now open for a month, there was no traffic, nobody's interested in your web server, maybe just should close it again. And last but not least, um, no, we are not fully there. This is, this is the marathon. And uh, yes, we have to do many, many, many more things before we reach this. But the direction is right. So here we are. We are facilitators as an enabler. We're doing consultancy. We're doing reviews. We're doing baselining. We are scanning the site up and down for vulnerabilities. We're doing more or less scanning everything. We're even running NMAP scans on our controls network until last week. Uh, doing production. Everything what is going down by an NMAP scan is not robust enough, doesn't deserve our networks. So we just pull them out and replace them barely happened in the last past month. Um, we were scanning devices. This was in 2007. Uh, some of you guys might have seen this before. We were scanning PLCs just with Nessus. And uh, at that time, 70% of the PLCs were dead, dead, which means that they're flickering with all the LEDs. And the controls process still might run somehow, but the communication is seized completely away. 50% of the devices were failing, which means that uh, the web server is not working anymore, FTP server is not working anymore. So there we had to do some, some other actions. And we were in contact with the con companies to get this fixed. Nowadays, it's looking much, much better. And uh, since this is not our core business, we stopped that activity. This is a power supply. Here's the Ethernet port. 70 seconds denial of service on that Ethernet port, and the power supply is dead. And the only thing to recover the power supply is going here and uh, putting the 220 volt plug and putting it back again. This is easy. Yes, it's easy if it's a lab system. We got thousands of those ones. How many students do we need to run around to pull the plug if somebody's launching something like a, such a campaign on your network? It takes you days. And last but not least, this is dosimeter reader, which is hanging in all of the places. Here's my personal dosimeter. You slot it in here to get your, 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 your monthly dose, just read out to a central database system. And um, it has an ethernet cable here. If you create or if you provoke a core dump of the internal operating system, you can extract the core via TFTP. If you look at the core dump via TFTP, then you find out the Telnet password, and then you own the box. Think of that, what I said, 30 seconds and you're in. I'm pretty sure there are more guys who can even do quicker. But you see, this is standard device, and it's not robust. We're doing disconnection tests, removing and disconnecting the controls network from everything else, really pulling the plug so we are independent. It's a wire, it's, it's an air gap then and we see what are the dependencies, and we try to remove the dependencies, so we have a, a last resort, and we can pull the cable then. And then we do the usual stuff. I won't go into details. We can do this in a coffee. Intrusion detection system, anomaly detection, DNS black holing, honeypot, central syslogging. We're doing credential hunts, looking if somebody is storing passwords and clear text on file systems, and of course, I'm provisioning the incident response team. So last but not least, here we are. My questions are, how do we get the future engineers to think in a more secure fashion? If you look at curriculums in universities, maybe not here, why is programming coming during the bachelor time, web server design in the web bachelor time, or a database set up in the bachelor time, but secure databases, secure web servers, secure programming only for the master? This is wrong. Security must not stand apart. Having a security conference is, sorry, it's utterly wrong. It must be. I've never seen a functionality conference or an availability conference or usability conference. Why is safety, why is security apart? It must be integrated. If you teach your people programming, teach them programming securely. If you teach them setting up a web server, how do you do this securely? At the very beginning. This is where we have to start. We have to work on our future engineers because they will do the control system in the, in the future. And then we have to deal with the past, and then we can start with some boxes and having some protection on, on legacy systems. More standard IT to the plant floor. We already started in control system using Windows, using TCP IP, mail, Ethernet. Now we should get the IT department in. They should provide this. For us, it's working. The database is coming from our database team, which are doing the databases for the HR department, for the physicist, and for the accelerator control systems. 
The network team at CERN is doing networking for everybody. Accelerators, computer center, office computing. And I think we should bring them even more in. I'm trying to get more and more things ripped away from the control system experts so they can con concentrate on their core work, doing the processes and doing really the frontline devices which are dedicated for controls processes. Agile vulnerability patching life cycle. Eric, I'm still believing prompt in situ patching must and will come in the future. But there are lots of discussion and lots and lots of problems with that one. Open procedures for certifying antivirus. I'm very happy seeing presentations about test stands. I would like to have something much more simple. I would like to have somebody coming up with one page of paper saying, you run those open tools on the device. If none of those tools report anything, the device is reasonably robust at that moment in time. And you can plug it on the device. You as a vendor can do this. I as a utility, since this is an open document, I can test and then I get faith and trust with you. And we can outsource this to a, to a security consulting company and they can make some money out of this. But instead, worldwide, on Europe, we're just investing, or we're investing time in big, full-blown test stands, which are very complicated and very complex. Why can't we start with something very simple? One sheet of paper with a tool set, which you just shoot at the devices, and everybody of us can just do the testing ourselves. Last but not least, no more standards, please. I am fed up. I have a pile of like that high of standards. There are plenty. Most of them are 90% the same and having something like 10% difference. And then if I hear that another country is developing a new standard instead of translating another standard, this is completely bollocks. I am done. Literature. Somebody wanted to know what are the four books I would recommend you to read for doing computer security. So here we go. I won't comment on that one. This is a must. The second one is Who Moved My Cheese? It's $5 in any bookstore in any airport. And it's about the human nature being reluctant to change. But face it, we are living in a world where change is dominant. There weren't any security problems to control systems 20 years ago, maybe not even 10 years ago, but now there are. We need to change, we need to adapt. And this book is very nicely showing how you can fail when you do not adapt to your environment. Animal Farm. Because still also in my place, there are some engineers, there are some physicists who believe they are more... Uh, they, they, are, they are more equal than the others. Exceptions for computer security are a killer. I'm maintaining 5,000 rules in my firewall. I have a life cycle for 5,000 rules and everything is proper. I'm monitoring them. I'm sending emails out automatically and tell the people, you're not using anything there. Can we close it? But I have a few firewall rules, maybe something like 100, which every now and then I need to go back to those firewall rules and analyze them manually whether they're still needed. It's a pain. I can manage... 10,000 websites automatically via central service, and I get an owner and get a control, and I have something like another 100 web servers sitting aside which cannot use the central service for whatever reason, or legacy. But there are exceptions, and exceptions are a killer, and this is reflecting that exceptions are a problem. And last but not least, 1984, no comment on that one. Thank you very much, I'm done. many places. Can I get my slide back, please? Yoo-hoo! So this is Angels and Demons. If you want to see the Atlas experiment in reality, this is in the film. They came to CERN and took some footage underground. No, there is no control room at that level because the radiation will just not be, be very, very pleasant. But still, uh, the experiment is real. Um, this is real. Uh, they are not. You can come to CERN, we're doing visit tours, you can come underground, not now anymore, but in 2017, 18 again, where we have open day, hopefully, and you can look at the apparatus yourself. If you want to see our computer center, Google Street View, just pull the small minifig or the small people on our computer center, just look for CERN computer center, and then you can make a virtual Street View tour through our computer center. If you have lots of time, since you are academic, <laughs> You can search for minifix. We were hiding something like 30 minifix in the computer center. You need to really zoom in the computer center, but they're all there. <laughs> Questions? I'm in awe of what CERN does as a layperson. It's been put 
to me in terms of um, a project that there's honour amongst thieves in terms of the hacking community. So it beats a life out of me why they hack soon. And it would indicate that nothing is off limits in that case. NASA has hacked. Yeah. CERN is, is, is under attack. We're permanently under attack like everybody else is. So um, if I look at my mm. network logs or my login logs, we're permanently probed. Uh, successful attacks are very rare. Why do the people do this? There are two, more or less, for me, there are two reasons. One reason is for the kudos. I managed to get in. And then you have lots of flame wars on the internet where people then saying, look here, I was defacing this web page. And then you see the comments below saying, oh, you do not hack CERN, they're part of us, and so on. So um, there's lots of discussions going on there. But life is, some people are weird enough that they do. And uh, this is externally uh, sponsored penetration testing for us. As long as they do not do too much harm, I'm even welcoming those, those things. Um, the second people who have tried to attack CERN is because of computing resources. Our computer center is big. This network of computer center is even bigger. Mm -hmm. And you've got computing power. So uh, cryptocurrency mining, Bitcoin mining, is something which is happening. Uh, but even there, we are quite quick to detect this. So there was, at the moment, I'm not aware that anybody made really substantial amount of money due to Bitcoin mining, because uh, we detect them too quickly. And nowadays, even if you take the computer center, they are CPUs. They're not GPUs or something more powerful. So I'm um, even now generating cryptocurrencies with a computer center. Uh, you should question whether the approach is still the best one. I would go for something more powerful. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Um, how you manage the communication with uh, the press and the public uh, government regarding attack or something like that, information you can, you can have in, in, the, in the web for attack on the cell and so on? So first, attacks which are attacks, I don't care. This is, this is how, do you, how do you count attacks? Is an attack like somebody is scanning our net, network? Is this one attack or is this every IP address probe being attacked? We don't. So, but this is, we're talking about successful attacks. Um, a, we got a press department which is briefed about security breaches. And then we get our contacts with our local ISP, which is a Swiss uh, provider. And we got contact with the CERT in France and in Switzerland. And if we need, we get also contact with CERTs all around the world because there might be security incidents which are not locally at CERN, but involving CERN virtual machines or part of this computing grid network. And then we get our, our own proper um, contacts. This is part of the CERT community. So um, it's established to be taking the same channel like everybody else is taking. Good morning, thanks for your great speech. I have one question. Uh, you are saying uh, uh, policy statements and, and computer security are not your topic. It say, you said on the other side, uh, the LHR devices may damage and if you have a problem, there are a lot of costs and the CERN project is really big investment. So it doesn't fit for me if you said security, it doesn't matter. On the other side, you have a very big investment. I, I didn't say that security doesn't matter. On certain levels, security don't matter, like on your personal laptop. If you go down to the control systems, yes, we're doing protecting the control systems. They are not connected to the internet. They are, they are, they are gateways into for remote access. The databases are protected properly. But the most important thing is safety. Our safety systems for the LHC are designed in such a way that they're getting independent, independent when we inject the beam. So before you can inject the beam, the safety systems give you the go. So it's more or less like a rocket launch. Yeah, all your systems must go, must, must be in go before you, you, you launch the rocket, and the, the rocket. And the same thing is for the LHC beams. When all the safety systems are on go, when all the parameters are fixed and verified, then you can inject beam. And at that moment, all the manipulation of the safety system is impossible. So in situ manipulation of the LHC is impossible by, or close to impossible, since you know there's no 100% security, by the means of, of, of digit, or by digital means of a cyber attack. The next thing is complexity. Usually complexity is a, is, is a disaster for computer security. For an attacker here, complexity is in our advantage because there are that many different safety systems and the complexity of running the beam is very complicated that if you start fiddling around in a way that you do some Mal manipulation of controls parameter, the safety system, one of the safety systems will kick in much more quicker than you can, can, you can do. So if you really want to do damage, you must be an insider, at least to my knowledge, you must be an insider. 
And if you're an insider, and this we have to face again, this is academic environment, an insider can be a student. I got students in my security team. We're not doing any background checks of those students because we assume they are all nice to CERN. This is part of our education. We have to accommodate those people. We might have students who are working for the extractor systems. And uh, those people just might take a hammer or pull somewhere a plug to do damage. But this risk which we have to assume, this is part of our business. And, uh, In principle, if you look, the computer center is separately secured. The control systems are chunked up into segments, um, blocks for accelerators, blocks for experiments. There are many experiments. They get all their own chunk, and they are disconnected, not disconnected, but uh, access limited from the office network. So there's a zoning system. Of course, we do that. And we have protection and uh, detection means in place. Uh, still, the safety systems are the last resort. And I would be very interested of somebody sophisticately being able to circumvent all the safety systems to do something, do something wrong. It's very, very complicated. Even running the LHC is very complicated. We lose the beam. If you think of this, we inject the beam. We keep the beam usually for 12 to 15 hours in the machine, just turning, 10,000 turns a second, 15 hours. This is production. 15 hours, collision, 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 collision. But very often, one of the safety systems are kicking in because there was something spurious. Some power supply, which was not at 12 volt anymore, but 1.9, 11.9 volts. So some, some non-stabilities, we detect them more or less, and then we dump the beam. And we do always an analysis, post-mortem analysis, while the beam was e uh, ejected again. And um, it's very complicated to manipulate this process. Not impossible, of course, but very complicated. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Time for one last question. Um, you mentioned how complex the machine is in terms of the suppliers. What work do you do to try and prevent insider attacks effectively stemming from infected equipment that gets brought in and plugged into the control network? For infected equipment, first the equipment it needs to go onto some kind of quarantine zone. So this is where we test the equipment first. We got some test stands where the equipment is going and usually then you see whether the, the, the equipment is sober enough that we can connect it to the, to the, um, to the main systems. However, we get not too many external suppliers in terms of computing. So most of the control systems for the accelerators are based on our hardware. We design the hardware. We provide the service. So the servers are more or less from our computer center, from our um, IT department. We do not allow any laptops on our controls network at all. There is no wireless. So um, there are two, three certified laptops which can be used for roaming, but still uh, nothing else can go on the network. So we control tightly what can go on the network. And, uh, for commercial application or commercial, commercial system which are shipped in, yes, we had that. We had one, one PC coming from a, a, one of our companies providing electricity, and this was highly infected with Configure. But this was detected easily when it went on our quarantine network, and uh, it didn't go further. Good. Thank you very much. Welcome. Again. Thank you.